Uh, this is a, a, a wildlife protection program, and I'm going to introduce our three guests. First is Dr. Chad Bishop. He's the director of the Wildlife Biology Program and professor in the Department of Ecosystem and Conservation Sciences here at the University of Montana. As director, Chad is responsible for a wide array of functions tied to running the wildlife program with an emphasis on faculty and student support, program outreach and development. He also teaches courses and leads multiple research projects. He's joined by Pete Papalillo. He's the executive director of Working Dogs for Conservation. Pete worked with the Wildlife Conservation Society for 10 years, first at their New York headquarters, then as part of the Africa and North America programs. Pete studied, I'm not even gonna come close to this one, Pete, Pharyngenus fox. Sorry, you, you can correct me when you get up here. Um, uh, in North America, avian community ecology in Kenya and large herbivore ecology and herding systems in Tanzania. He's helped to plan and carry out conservation strategies in Bolivia, Ecuador, Argentina, Congo, Colombia, Tanzania, and the United States. Well, that's quite, a, quite an itinerary. They're also joined by uh, Brianne Black. She is the Outreach and Development Coordinator. After graduating from the University of Montana, she worked and volunteered on conservation projects in Montana and Washington. She spent the last 12 years working for local and national animal welfare groups. Bree has filled many roles with animal welfare organizations, including development, volunteer management, cruelty and disaster response, and behavior and training. Would you please put your hands together and welcome our guests? Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm really excited to be here with you today. Um, just to get like some initial interaction, I have no idea how this is gonna go in this room. So I'm gonna ask you in the count of three, in a second here, to say your favorite wild animal in the state of Montana. We'll see if anything prevails over the, in the room. So favorite wild animal in the state of Montana, one, two, three. I heard raccoons was close. <laughs> um, so hopefully today, um, we're going to give you just a little bit more exposure to um, the whole realm of wildlife biology, wildlife conservation, wildlife management, and have some good interactive um, uh, exercises with that. And, uh, and then we're here to engage with you and um, looking forward to that. So just really quick, I wanted to introduce to you, uh, excuse me. actually, can you set that beat? Um, so just so you have a little bit of orientation to like what is a wildlife biology program for those of you who might not um, be as familiar, but this is the mission of our wildlife biology program at, at University of Montana. For those of you back in the room, might not be able to see that super well, but basically we focus on the ecology and conservation of free living organisms and their habitats. So basically what that does means is that through education of students and through research we do um, here locally and throughout the world, we're focused on both understanding organisms, all aspects of their ecology, um, so that we can in turn use that knowledge and information to help inform strategies to conserve wildlife. Again, at all scales from right out here um, down the bitter root up to Blackfoot all the way to working in um, ecosystems throughout the world. Um, just a, a little bit of sense, and I'll, I'll be done with our wildlife program quickly here, but just give you a sense of like who we are at, at this university. Um, we have the 26 interdisciplinary faculty that make up the wildlife program. We like to say we cover everything from gene to biome. So one thing to just think about in fish and wildlife um, conservation, it's it's broad. You can you can do all kinds of different work in those realms. From you could specialize in molecular cellular work. You could even specialize on the totally opposite of that spectrum and focus on policy. Um, we have students right now that are working in conservation genetics labs. And we have students right now that are, well, even we have one doing an internship with the Council on Environmental Quality at the White House right now. So we can, it's very diverse work that happens 
Um, so we had about 340 under, undergrads. They come from all over the United States. We have about every state in the United States represented in our program at any given moment. Um, those of you that you've grown up in Montana. So one thing I can tell you, I did not grow up in Montana. You don't want to take it for granted. Um, I grew up in Iowa and uh, came to Montana, but we have students from all over the country and world who want to do anything they can to get to experience a little bit of Montana. They had the privilege to grow up with. Um, we, we get students from all over. Um, and then our grad students, about 65 to 70 at a time, their main work is to do research projects. And so they're doing two things. They're helping us advance conservation at the same time um, while they're getting an education. Um, so what do fish and wildlife biologists do? Just very more generally, this would be like if I had to come up with a mission statement that would just kind of generally capture the hundreds of NGOs and state and federal agencies and private entities that do wildlife conservation, it might be something like this. Generally, to conserve, protect, and enhance the fish and wildlife um, species out there on the landscape and their habitats. And it's all about trying to conserve biodiversity while also providing opportunities for humans to interact um, with wildlife. So how do we do it? Well, we're, we're training people then that go out and take those jobs that I just referenced with all those NGOs, governmental agencies, private entities. And it, this is the biggest thing I just wanna emphasize that conservation is getting increasingly complex. There's a lot of a lot of threats out there, as, as I'm sure you're well aware, for our ability to conserve species sustainably for the long um, term. And so for us to be successful, it, it, if there was ever, like it takes a village kind of concept, um, it's this. And so we have people working in all these different realms and all these different positions. And together, through all those synergistic efforts, we can make headway in, in, in conservation. So here's just some of the positions that, that people do in, in fish and wildlife um, in fields. Uh, and I'm just, you can look at those. Um, but there's quite a few different, different um, actual jobs that people pursue um, after they get their degrees in, 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 a, in a fish and wildlife program. We'll just hit on a couple of those here in a minute or for a second. So fish and wildlife biologists, generally, it's a very general term. But, but generally speaking, what does a biologist do? Well, one of the big things biologists do is determine the status of species. This isn't the easiest thing in the world to do. And I'm gonna come back to that before we turn it over to uh, Pete and Bree, because they're, they're tied in with this with their work. But if you think about it, we can go out and do a census on people. And even that's not the simplest thing. We wanna count the number of people out there. It's another thing to think about elk. Like if you picture elk, you can kind of see them, they're pretty big. You can picture being in a, maybe in a helicopter and flying over the landscape and counting them. We still can't do that perfectly, but we can do a pretty good job, especially if we do a nice survey design. Um, but now let's think about something like um, maybe modern butterflies. It's getting a little more complicated now. Like how do you count them? How do we determine if those species are increasing or decreasing? And what's the status of that species? What about um, snails that you can't even quite um, maybe just go out and even visually detect. So these are the things that biologists work on. Um, even things like, if any of you have heard of white nose syndrome, we had to figure out overnight how to do a lot of bat surveys quickly as white nose syndrome. For bat populations. Um, but this is what biologists are trained to do. So that's one big thing. How do we go out there and estimate what populations are doing? Then, once you know that, we want to understand why. So if the population is declining, especially, we want to understand why. And so we design studies and, and go out there and, and, and implement different strategies to, that can be part of study so that we can understand what are those factors. And then that understanding can then lead to the formulation of management conservation strategies. In a nutshell, fish and wildlife biologists are out there doing. And then they're making those big recommendations as well to policymakers and people that are in the leadership positions of organizations, even legislatures, even governors and the president, um, making some of those recommendations as to, um, based on our best knowledge, here's what we'd recommend if we wanna conserve that species. Researchers and scientists, just a little bit different role. They're focused on the 
bigger kind of advancing our state of knowledge. So I mentioned white nose syndrome. Just by a show of hands, has anybody heard of white nose syndrome? Oh, good, a number of you have. So for those of you who know about it, it caught us off guard. So all of a sudden, you've got this, this up, and man, it's wiping out bat populations fast. If, if at that moment, what do you want to do? Well, you want to learn as much as we can. And so researchers and scientists are often the ones that are tasked with, okay, we need you to go out there and your full-time job and focus is going to be designing research to go out there and implement a, a project that will help us really try and better understand that one thing. And then hopefully generate that knowledge then that others, all those biologists can use to help manage the species. Um, so as part of all that work, that's where like our, our, our knowledge has come from. Uh, if you go back a century ago, we did not know actually that much about the needs of, of, a, of most of the organisms out there. We didn't understand like much about them at all. Because of all that accumulated knowledge over 100 years, we know a lot now. And that's from a lot of the work of researchers and scientists. Um, yeah, so habitat knowledge coordinators, this is just to empathize. The habitat is oftentimes ever more important than the work that we do in the organisms themselves. If you think about ecosystems, it's the underlying ecosystem that sustains a set of interacting species. And so there's a lot of positions that are focused on, on that habitat management and conservation. A lot of work with private landowners. So how many of you live on a ranch or a farm? Okay, there's a, a number of you, a handful of you. So when you think about that, the ranchers, the farmers out there that are managing those private lands, you and, and them collectively are critical to our ability to conserve species um, here in Montana, across the United States, across the globe. So there's a lot of important work that attempts to happen in partnership with landowners in order to try and implement strategies that allow a landowner, that farmer, that rancher to make a living, to meet their needs, while also being like these key stewards up in the landscape that are critical for us concerning biodiversity. There's also a whole bunch of positions out there like fish and wildlife managers and conservation officers. You guys have probably seen the game wardens out there in Montana, fish life and parks, um, all kinds of manager officer positions that are they're basically that kind of jack of all trades handling all kinds of the, the fish and wildlife management responsibilities in their assigned district or, or area. Um, also, and this is an important point, that we put these laws in place in our country and, and both for like hunting and fishing restrictions and, and also just all kinds of other laws that apply to conserving wildlife. We need law enforcement of presence in order to enforce those laws. So a whole lot of that goes in with, with these folks. They're also assisting with wildlife surveys. Um, they do, but they also do a lot of interaction with people. Um, that's an important point of our of working in fish and wildlife. So much of it is, is interacting with people in a whole host of ways. But these folks can be one day they can be out doing a wildlife survey. The next day they might be in a second grade classroom. Um, the next day they might be talking to a landowner. And then the next day they might be at a county commission meeting or a wildlife commission meeting. Another big aspect in our field is what we call human dimensions and social science. So this is an emerging part of our field. And basically this in a nutshell is we need to be getting as good of data on the public or on, on humans and their interaction and interest and ties to wildlife as we're getting on the wildlife organisms themselves. And so this is a, basically every new textbook that comes out. Um, anytime you hear uh, a wildlifer like me get up and give a talk about the future of wildlife it's always identifying we need a greater focus on human dimensions and social science um, like one thing that just came out a couple of our professors just released their most recent work on um, a major survey they did of montana relative to their attitudes and orientations for grizzly bears so that type of data that's collected very rigorously and scientifically is really helpful as we try and make decisions with the public in mind, because ecologically, if humans had ultimate never any tolerance, we could have a lot, a lot of grizzly bears. They, they, it's, they do that. 
We could also have very, very, very few grizzly bears, fewer than we have right now, way fewer. But you can kind of see we're having really good data on public input, and this is really important to make these decisions. Um, just about done here, turn it over to um, Pete and Bree. But so another just thing, like for those of you who might have interest in, in um, like more like math and statistics, uh, for example, we have um, population and spatial ecologists that their primary work is working with data. And a lot of us have some roles of this in our job, but some really specialized in this. And you think about with what I've told you about trying to understand species populations, why they're increasing, decreasing, or staying stable. It's a whole lot of things like calculus that comes into that and mathematical statistics and spatial ecology and working with all that satellite data that's collected by satellites. And um, you can picture, we put satellite collars around all these organisms. We know everywhere these different organisms go. We can even do this with birds and bats now. They even put a GPS collar on an insect here just a, a recently. But you can think about this. We can know everywhere that animal goes. With satellites, we know everything about the landscape that they're doing. That's a lot of data to analyze to make sense of it all. Um, just, just quick to let you know, like if you're interested in being a veterinarian, a lot of people don't think about it, but fish and wildlife veterinarians are play a big role in our, in our field. And um, they have some of the coolest jobs that are out there. One day you can get out there and capture a grizzly bear or, or um, hand on a moose, and the next day you're being asked to attend a conference, maybe even internationally, and uh, tend to be some of the biggest experts. Okay, so I'm going to just stop to my transition. So if we think about well, what does it mean to conserve fish and wildlife, you should have a feel for it now. But I talked to you about monitoring populations. So one of the big things we do is develop and implement strategies to monitor those populations so we know where they are and how many of them there are. A big thing that we do now is using DNA and remote sense cameras. But especially think about that DNA. So if we can get DNA samples from the environment of an organism, let's say hair or scat, then extract DNA from that and often identify the individual that belongs to. That's really useful for us. We can also, a big part of endangered species especially, threatened endangered species is combating wildlife poaching and trafficking. And then protecting, restoring critically important habitat. And we've talked about the habitat connection and then addressing biological and ecological factors that are causing the species. Now, when you think about these first two, a really cool connection that's that's happened is dogs. And if you think about what dogs have that's in other animals do that we don't have, they have this incredible ability to, to detect things that the smell. And uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to working dogs for conservation with Pete and Marie, and uh, we'll take it from there. Yeah. Okay, the question was when I just referenced putting a, a GPS tracking device on an insect. So this is actually Sean Cleveland, who's actually living here in Missoula. He's doing this on a project in Asia. I think it's a hornet, but he's been he's traveled over there. But they're literally, and I, I can't remember how they're mounting it. But it just technology has changed so fast that, you, like, even five years ago, that would have been unimaginable. Well, I'll turn it to these guys, and I think we're going to have a long time for Q&A. All right. Hi, guys. All right. So my name is Pete Coppolillo. I'm the executive director uh, for our organization. It's called Working Dogs for Conservation. Uh, we're based here in Montana. It's founded here in Montana. Um, this is Brianne Black. She's our Outreach and Development Coordinator, and this is Fenton. Fenton is a, um, he's, he's half Border Collie, half Aussie Shepherd, and he was rescued in California. Like all of our dogs, he's a, he's a rescue, and you'll learn a little bit about what they do right now. So we're gonna focus on, we do a number of the things that Chad mentioned, um, but we're gonna focus on protection and, and how dogs help protect uh, wildlife by stopping wildlife crime. Um, so I'll give you a few examples and tell you a few quick stories, and then we can answer all the questions you guys have. So the neat thing about dogs is that they can they can stop crimes, or we can use dogs to stop wildlife crime before 
a crime happens before somebody poaches an animal or during, we can disrupt, stop a crime when it's in action um, or after, after it happens. Because as you guys know, lots of times people will move that animal, take it, try to sell it somewhere else. And I'll show you examples of how they do it and some of the neat new kind of cutting edge technology ways that, that we do that now. So all of these things happen in a, in a variety of different contexts. Many of you probably know about drug dogs or narcotics or bomb sniffing dogs. Well, wildlife detection dogs work in a very similar way. We can search vehicles. And I'll tell you a specific example about that and a dog that came from Montana. And then I'm gonna tell you about some other cool technologies that, that, um, that you might not imagine that we combine with dogs that make both of them more, more effective. So this is, um, this is called Delta Team. These guys are in Zambia. They're in the South Luangwa um, uh, National Park in Zambia. And that guy there, his name is Ruger. He was, he was rescued from the Blackfeet Nation up in Browning. And the cool thing about Ruger was that while he was training to be a, a conservation dog, he went blind. He lost his sight. But he was such a good dog and he had such a good nose. He was such a des high desire to work that he, he could work through it. He worked through it and he became, he was one of the first two conservation dogs to go to Zambia. Um, and in his first um, nine months in the field, he put over 150 poachers out of business. And the way he did that was by detecting um, guns and ammunition. So that's, that's Ruger working at a roadblock just outside the national park. And if anybody tried to bring a gun or ammunition or bushmeat, well, in any guns or ammunition into the park, or bushmeat or wildlife parts or a live animal out of the park, Ruger would catch up. Ruger could smell that stuff. And one of the coolest stories was the very first day that Ruger was working, he was deployed on a bus. And many of you, if you've ever been lucky enough to get to go on a safari or been to Africa, you know that sometimes the cars are really overloaded. It happens in Latin America, it happens all over the world too, right? Cars super overloaded, tons of luggage, stuff on the back, and Ruger alerts at the back of the truck. So they take the luggage off, and they lay it out in the line, and, and he goes along the line and he alerts on a suitcase. So they're kind of looking at it like what's going to happen here. They open the suitcase and look inside, they can't see anything. So they lay out all the clothes and the stuff in the suitcase, and he alerts on a pair of pants. So then they go through the pockets of the pair of pants, and they find in the pocket, in a matchbox, wrapped in plastic, was a single primer cap. Primer cap is what you use. To, to make the explosion that fires a muzzle loader, a muzzle loader that's used to poach elephants. Well, the best part about that story was everybody who was on that bus was standing on the side of the road and they watched this whole thing happen. And Ruger from that day forward was famous. So to this day, you can take a black dog into a village in the Luangwa Valley in Zambia and they'll say, is that Ruger? <laughs> because poachers were very afraid of him for a very long time. So that, that, that program was really successful. And in fact, this is another different black dog. Her name was Wicked. And what you can see there, can you guys see that? That's a snare. That's an illegal snare. So people use snares to, to, to catch wildlife and all sorts of different kinds. And the thing about those is they're indiscriminate. They kill lots of different species. So Wicked was, was one of the two first dogs ever trained to detect snares, to find them. Because just that little bit of human odor on it or the odor of the snare itself, they could find it and she could tell her handlers where they were and they could remove it so it didn't kill any wildlife. That program was really successful and that led to a new program, a different program in Serengeti, which is up in Tanzania, right in East Africa. And this program was a little bit different and it was different because of this guy. This guy's a, he really is a rocket scientist. You know how people joke and say, I'm not a rocket scientist. He really is one. And he was an old friend of mine and I came to, we, we came to bring the dogs and I run into him and he is working on this thing. He's sitting in the, in the, in the mess hall, just like this. And he's got this thing open in front of him. And I said, Steve, what are you doing? He says, well, I'll put this camera trap back together. I said, you're a rocket scientist. Why do you have to put a trail camera back together? They, you guys can just buy one. He said, well, this one's kind of special. It has um, an artificial intelligence chip in it. And so it can interpret what's in the image. And I said, that's pretty cool. And he said, yeah, and I wired in a sat phone. So once it, if it sees a human in the image, it can email that picture of that human to me. And I said, wow, that's pretty amazing, right? And, and he said, yeah, then I can put it together and I bury the guts of it underground and I just leave the, the lens above ground. 
So the, the, in East Africa, it's illegal to walk into a protected area on foot. That's so that people can't poach, but it's also so that so for their own safety. But he can hide that little camera, and if somebody's going in to poach an animal, camera can take their picture and alert the game scouts, the rangers, and then they can go and catch them before they kill an animal. But what's really cool about that is, you know, even if the rangers are, are half a mile or a mile away, it takes them a little while to get there. And often a poacher or somebody can hear them coming, right? So they can just hide. But you guys probably know about search and rescue dogs about tracking, right? Benton or any other dog can find you, whether you're hiding or not. Follow your footsteps, follow right to where you are. So this combination of dogs and cameras is an incredibly powerful force for, for, for conservation. So this is Steve, and he said, this is how I hide him. He bets elephant duck, he covers it in elephant duck, and he hides them. And the best part about it is the poachers don't know when, where you saw them. They don't know where the camera is. So when the dog catches them a kilometer down the trail, they don't know how, how he did it. So a lot of times, some will say, you know, is this witchcraft? Or what are these dogs doing? How do they know we're here? Well, this is what we did. And, and in fact, th that's me. Steve put a camera out and said, go try to find it. And that's me and a guy named Grant Burton. And we walked around for about 15 minutes looking for that camera. And his phone the whole time was going ping, 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 because it was emailing these pictures of us to him <laughs> the whole time. So those dogs trained. And then one night during their training, this was in Serengeti, we got these photos on the cameras. That's someone carrying supplies to a, a, a bush camp. And those are meat drying racks. Those are the meat after an animal's been poached. They dry it so it's lighter to carry and they carry it out. And so they called us in the middle of the night and said, can the dogs deploy? They were really just starting to learn how to do this. We said, well, let's see, let's see how they do. This is a map of their track. That's 14 kilometers long. 14 kilometers they tracked through the night, through Serengeti, where you have lions and hyenas and wildebeest and all sorts of stuff. They got to the end of a snare line. This is where a snare line was. They, they got recovered over 600 snares, arrested six poachers, and unfortunately, they'd been poaching there for a while. They recovered 986 pounds of bush meat. Um, so this was their very first, very first operation, and they've continued to do it. Our collaborators have continued to make these cameras even fancier. That's how small they are now. And that's in fact, that's three cameras right there. And now we can put them up high. We can put them up in a tree looking down. And for some reason, people don't think to look up in the trees. And so we can catch, we can catch people and it tells you the probability even these days. Now, so they're amazing. They're amazing tools for wildlife. And they're going all over Africa now to try to help make these uh, protected areas safer for elephants and rhinos and all sorts of other species. So unfortunately, we're not always successful, right? Um, animals still get poached. You guys know about the poaching crisis. You know about wildlife trafficking. A lot of that stuff gets moved around the world in shipping containers. And shipping containers are a really hard problem for us to work on in terms of law enforcement because they're sealed. They leave one country. Many of you have been through customs. You know how that is. They're sealed, so you can't look inside them. Or if you do look inside them, you have to break the seal. And even then, they might be loaded top to bottom with stuff. So it takes hours and hours to, to, to unload it, to you know, search every box to do all of that stuff. Well, we've developed with some collaborators, um, we've modified an old method where we take the air from inside the container and we suck it out with a vacuum. We suck the air out of the container. And this is how we developed this method right here in, in Missoula at our facility um, using, uh, using model containers, small trash cans as containers and just regular stuff that you can buy at the hardware store so that anybody can do it anywhere. And what we do is we suck the air out of that container and we pass it through a filter. And then we give those filters to dogs like Fenton. And then Fenton will tell us if there's ivory in the container because the scent of the ivory comes out, gets caught in the filter, and then he can say, he'll do his alert and he'll say it's there. And so we've done this um, now for ivory, shark fin, uh, pangolin scales, number all of the wildlife that get trafficked all around the world. And then what we do is we combine that with intelligence. There's lots of intelligence, information, who's trafficking where, and we identify, then we can identify which one of those containers do we suck the air out of and, and, uh, and present those to the dogs. And the intelligence folks can predict with up to 60 to 80% accuracy which of those has contraband in it. And then the dogs come in and, and, and tell them, hey, that's the one to go search. 
So it's a really powerful new tool that we're able to, to use. Chad mentioned the game wardens. There are game wardens, there are thousands of game wardens around the country. There are only about 200 of them have canine units. And often those guys, guys, there are a handful of women who are also uh, handlers, they're alone. They're often the, in, in, in by themselves. So we do something called the Conservation Canine Officers Association. And everything that we learn, then we can teach to all of them. So we learn how to do something here in Montana, and then we push it out to these guys in, in the rest of North America and over 200 dogs and handler teams in Africa. So everybody gets to learn how to do it. So we make one breakthrough, everybody else moves forward. The last thing I'll tell you about dogs, and I know um, you guys are tired of listening to me talk. You'd rather see Fenton work. You're going to get to see Fenton do a little bit of his work here. Everybody likes the dogs better than they like me. I've gotten used to it. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but but we learned that through our work, you know, we'd go places and we'd help, we'd help biologists count wolverines or bears or whatever. And they'd always laugh. They'd say, I've been out here working for 15 years. The press has never come to see me. They don't, they haven't, you know, come once. And then all of a sudden you guys show up with your dog and now everybody wants to hear about it. So we learned that dogs are really kind of a powerful thing, Oops, sorry, a powerful tool for outreach. Um, and, and film crews love to see them, the press likes to see them, everybody. Um, and, and so a lot of times conservation is about changing people's behavior. And the way that you can reach people is by telling them stories and, and, and getting them interested in things. And so coming to see a dog work and seeing what they do and say, oh, well, why are they out here inspecting boats? you know, or searching for ivory in cars. This is a guy whose name was the giant Salvinia man. He dresses up as, a, as an aquatic plant and goes to these uh, he goes to these fishing shows, tells people to clean their boats. And so it's a great opportunity to reach out to people. And the press loves the dogs. They get so much press. There was a recent story here um, in Montana. It got picked up on 21 NPR stations in 21 different states, right? And so that's a real opportunity for us to tell, tell those stories and, and reach out to everybody else. So these are our addresses. You can you can find Bree and me. And here's the best part now. Now you get to watch Fenton, Fenton work. So um, Fenton uh, was rescued from California. He works on all sorts of different stuff. He does some law enforcement, but he also does some invasive species. Um, he's also trained on bears. Um, so we've hidden um, some, um, what is it? Oh, okay. We've hidden a sample of like contraband, wildlife contraband here in the room. Okay, and so Fenton's going to look for it. So what you're going to watch, what you're going to look for, is you're going to see him. Fenton's, Fenton works off leash, so just if he comes near you, he's he's really more interested in finding his target, and you'll see why. Um, so if he comes near you, just sit, just let him. He's a sweetheart. He's a lover. Um, you know, don't reach out for him or anything like that. But he won't bother anybody. But he's going to run around and he's going to look for his target. And what you're going to see is mostly you'll see his head up like this. And that's him air scenting, right? And then when he gets close, he's going to start to zig and zag, right? And that, that, that's your signal. You see he's starting to get close. It's a little bit hard in here because there's not a lot of air moving. When you've got wind, that moves the odor, and then you can see him track it right back. So now the odor is just going like this. So he may have to circle around a little bit. It may take him a little bit to find it. And that's Bree's job is to help him. And, and when he finds it, his alert is to sit. But he gets kind of excited. So he, he often does a little spin. You'll see him do a little spin when he when he sits. But then his job is to sit and hold his nose on it. <laughs> that was actually the bag that the sample came in today. That's what we call residual odor. And he was he's cheating a little bit. And then yeah. so he's gonna he he looks and he looks, and then he's gonna get paid. Once he finds it, he'll get paid. And his paycheck is his toy. All of our dogs are, are toy reward dogs, and that's for a reason. That's so that, that if you pay them with food, did you see him change his behavior there? And he switched back, look, and now he's, he's saying, hey, there's something here, there's something back here. I think there he goes, and he found it. <laughs> and that's his paycheck right here, yeah. <laughs> Maybe he likes to do a little victory lap. Good job, buddy. So that's his paycheck. And he loves, he loves to, to play with his toy. And what he really loves is to play with his toy and interact with his handler. And, and that's what makes dogs so special. Dogs do, like Chad said, they, their noses really are the best chemical sensor the world's ever known. They can detect things down to parts per billion. 
But what makes them so special is that they love us and they want to work with us. So we can train them to find all these new and different strange, strange things like that. And so fentanyl will work all day long. Then they put the toy away and then they go and search again to another one. Sometimes you have to be careful taking it away from him because he'll nip and he'll take it. So, so now he's going to go out and look again. And it looks looks like he yeah he's on to another one. You see how it's turning around? And there's another alert. <laughs> okay, so that's all we can we can uh, just stay here and answer as many questions as you guys like. Maybe Chad, yeah, come back up because it's not just another dog. Oh, is there something? Yeah, very good. So let's do the same thing. If you all wouldn't mind using the microphone, it just allows everybody to hear your question. Come on up. There's a microphone on the far side. There's one here. Feel free. We've got about 30 minutes or so or plus for Q&A. Yeah. Okay, there was, there was one. Oh, there you are. Okay. All right, I'm Abigail from Gardner. And my question is about, um, so I, I know that there's new technology that predicts poaching behavior in protected areas in Africa. Uh, so like what areas of the protected area would be vulnerable for poachers to come in? And I'm wondering if you use that technology to determine where to put the cameras, like if that works in tandem or even where you put the dogs, like where, where they're housed, that kind of thing. Yeah, so we um, we did a, a workshop in in, uh, in Nairobi a number of years ago, and we had somebody from the, the a retired CIA agent, <laughs> and we asked her all sorts of questions about trafficking and how it all works and everything. And her her answer was really enlightening to me. She said, "If you can think of you know a, the craziest idea you can think of, or what a, a poacher or a trafficker or somebody might do," she said, "They've already thought of that, and then the next five steps down the the road." So it's a constant, it, you know, you've heard the term arms race. It's a constant arms race trying to figure out. It used to just be, you know, patrols at the boundaries. And um, and now there are, like you said, all sorts of sophisticated technologies, something called shot spotter, that if someone fires a gun inside of a protected area, there are listening microphones up on hills, and they will triangulate and tell them where exactly where it is. So it's always it's always changing. And it changes by area and by species as well. So I always say there are two kinds of protected areas in Africa. They're the ones with, without rhinos and the ones with rhinos. And, and rhino horn is so valuable. You know, a single rhino horn could be worth a quarter of a million dollars, you know? And, and so in, in those areas, the level of protection and the level of poaching pressure is far, far higher. So it's a lot of, it's, it's a lot of local knowledge, you know? And, and they use intelligence just like, just like DEA agents or anybody else to know where to go and how to, how to enforce. Thank you. Uh, how does a snare work and how does it kill? So um, I should say snaring is snaring is illegal in Africa. Um, and it, it is it is legal to use snares here. Trapping is legal here. Um, you know, but not anywhere and not under any circumstances or any season, but it's it's a regulated form of hunting. Um, and they work very similarly. Those are homemade. Um, and so what, what it is, it's, it's, like a, it's like a noose. It's just like a loop. And um, the, depending on what species they're going for, the animal either walks through it or steps in it. And then, and then often there's a, a branch or a spring or something that will release. As soon as they step in it, it releases and then it tightens. And it'll tighten. But unfortunately, it could tighten around their foot. It could tighten around an elephant's trunk. Sometimes it'll get around. And often that animal's just stuck there and they just struggle to death. So it's a it's a pretty inhumane way to hunt in Africa. Um, here in this country, you know, there are regulations about how, how they happen. They're mechanical, they're a little bit fancier, they work more quickly. So, you know, I don't want to equate the two, but um, it's a, it, you know, it, it varies, same thing, it varies from place to place. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Alexa from Gardner as well. I was just wondering, where do the dogs that you use for conservation come from, and how do you transport them to the conservation areas? Good question. Um, when we were a little organization, they just came from, from Montana 
And then we started to have to find more. And you know, it's a very special set of characteristics we look for. So Fenton's, Fenton is a maniac for his toy, right? I'm sure many of you have know these kinds of dogs. You make the mistake of throwing their ball for them once, and then they bring it back and they clip it in your lap, and then they want to do it again and again, and then you take the ball away, and then they get a stick. You take a stick away, and they get a rock. You know these ones? They're crazy like that. That's that's serious toy drive, right? So that's one of the things we look for. But then we also look for what we call nerve strength, right? So Fenton, he has to work in the in in the Snake River on a boat, right? Some of the African dogs they get flown around in helicopters. We've had to take them, you know, on in, in all sorts of crazy stuff, airplanes, and even even one time elephant back because they couldn't get into a place in Myanmar. So that's a very peculiar set of, of characteristics. So we screen about a thousand dogs for every one that we take. So what that means is we had to get cast a wider and wider net. And so now we get dogs from all over the country. Um, so like I said, Fenton came from California. Uh, in fact, someone had rescued him in California. Originally, he was going to be a search and rescue dog, but he didn't like to walk on the rubble that's required for rescues. So then that organization called us and said, hey, do you want Fenton? Because he, he's, he's a great dog, but he can't do that. So um, we have a website called Rescues to the Rescue, and any shelter volunteer anywhere in the country can go screen an animal, screen a dog, upload the data, and send it not just to us, but any other um, any other working dog organization, and then they can um, and then they can find rescue dogs. So it's it's a great way because Fenton would not be a great um, home dog if he didn't have a job. He would lose his mind, and you can see he's a little impatient. He wants to go back to work right now. <laughs> Thank you so much. I am Aiden, I'm from Joliet, and I have a few questions. I'm wondering, has the poaching crisis gotten any better in the past year? And also, what do you think the dogs? Thanks, thanks, Aiden. Um, yeah, it, some aspects, some parts of it have gotten better. So ivory poaching um, is, is starting to go down. Um, we're making strides with, with rhino horn poaching. But um, I often I often point out to people that there are hundreds of species that are poached and trafficked around the world, and some of them we don't even know about. So there was a, a, a story about a, a, a fish called a totoaba that lives in the in the um, Gulf of California. There was an active trade in totoaba for almost a decade before anybody even knew it was happening. They their swim bladders were were exported to China for ten thousand dollars each. And it was a very active trade. It was going on for years before anybody, any law enforcement knew it was even happening. So we, we've got a long way to go before, before you know, poaching is over. Some of the big high profile species like elephants and rhinos host countries like, like China. China was the destination for a lot of ivory. They have now said no more importations of wild ivory, but there's still a black market. So it's like drugs, you know, it, it, it can, and often it's the same people who are trafficking wildlife products and drugs and guns and ammunition and even sort of people. So it is getting better in some places, but it's we've got a long way to go. The second part of your question is what kind of breeds do we use? They tend to be the working breeds, so herding dogs, labs, shepherds, malinois, like that. But the truth is we, we screen for their behavioral characteristics, that toy drive and their persistence, how much they like to search, will they work all day, and, and can they handle all the crazy stuff that we do? So in fact, our most common dog now in, in our in our kennel, we've got about 50 dogs worldwide now, um, is like Fenton, it's a month. <laughs> they can, you know, they can all do it. They've all got good sense of smell. It's that behavior and that drive to work with it. That's what we select. Thank you so much. I have a question for Dr. Um, I know you mentioned that you could speak to the process of getting permissions to go out and move and hear the conversation. And also work with tribal officials for these devices. Yeah, they, did you say the very end of your question on work with tribal agencies on? On the bison hunts. Oh, on the bison, yeah. Uh, so, like in Southern Uh huh. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, so, so the simple answer to your to your initial question is that it, it depends on some degree. So, if we're going to work with like large mammals, and let's say I talked about the GPS collars going out. In any of that work um, requires a capture permit, and so often then, um, and so I like I, just as an example, I worked with Colorado Parks and Wildlife before I came here. So we had the capture permits, and we would work with universities 
but we have those. And now here, if we're going to do much work in Montana, we're always going to do it in conjunction with Montana Fish and Wildlife Parks. But nobody can go out and just capture and handle those animals without that permit. Um, if it's um, like like passerines, smaller birds, lots of times you'll you'll be able to be applied for and get that permit. You can do the handling. Um, it's a great question. So in, in all the work we do, it, you always have to have that permitting and those um, uh, approvals in place before you do a repeal. Um, and, and we're doing actually a, a lot more with tribes right now. Um, so actually, um, I have three grad, native graduate students in my lab right now where I'm working on a project Blackfeet Reservation, a project the Yakima Reservation in Washington, and one on Apache Mescalero in um, New Mexico. Um, but as far as specific to bison, we do have one grad student who's working um, on a bison project in conjunction with Blackfeet. Um, and one exciting thing that just happened is the whole national bison strategy just got signed. And maybe, okay, you're not, you know. Not. So Brendan Moynihan, who's right here on campus, he's the nation's bison lead for the Department of Interior. And he's right, his office is right in the College of Portion and Conservation Building here. And so um, he's really excited. I mean, I, he's played a big role in that working with the tribes. And so I think we have a, um, a, a lot of excitement ahead and, and uh, our, so some of the students we're training are now working on those reservations that are doing the bison work. Yep, great, thank you. Hi, my name is Jade and I'm from Helena. Um, my question is, I was wondering how long the dogs have to go under training and if they only respond one hand over. Um, dogs are like people, um, so they're all different. Um, the fastest one ever was, you saw Wicket the snare dog. Uh, she was rescued from Anaconda and she was nine weeks from the shelter to the field. Um, but she was really, we really needed her to go quickly. Um, Fenton is, is, he's a pretty easygoing guy. He'll work for anybody, but we've got other dogs who are one, one person only. Thank you. Uh, I had a quick question about uh, fox. How exactly do you guys manage with those things? You said foxes, right? Yeah, so it all depends on, um, so, so maybe, let me just kind of put it in this context. So if we um, really wanted to get a good estimate, let's say a, a fox population density and what that population was doing, prior to DNA and the, those remote sense cameras, we might actually do a study where you go out and trap a bunch of foxes, and then we would um, either do re-sighting surveys, which were most efficient with foxes, because right, they're hard to see. So then you might go, and, and this isn't, I mean, we have humane trapping procedures, but it's not the most greatest. So what we would do is then go back and set a whole bunch more traps. And then we would see the ratio of newly trapped foxes, how many of them had a mark, because we handled them before, versus how many didn't. And you can kind of picture that. That's how you start to estimate population size. So you can imagine if, if almost every one you're recapturing is marked, then you got most of them. If every one in every 10 is marked, there's a whole lot of still out there in the population. But now we can do that with cameras, or we have ways that we would get um, hair, or we might even contract with feet, and then they would run out and do and do uh, transect surveys to find scat. And in fact, I got a PhD student right now in Idaho, we're just launching a year-long scat survey process where their, their dogs are gonna be, the dogs will be, um, detecting predator scats, so that we can, well, carnivore and omnivore scats, so we'll be looking at what bears, lions, and wolves um, are, are, are eating in their diet. Um, but yeah, so it's a great question. Thanks. Thank you. Um, you said that your dog was a toy trained dog instead of a treat trained dog. Could you explain why? Um, well, it's just sort of inherent to them. Some dogs are motivated by food, some are motivated by toys. So that's that's sort of just what's in them. And we screen for it, but the reason we use toy motivated dogs is because um, they don't satiate over the day. So, you know, sometimes like Wicket, um, one day she found um, 48 bear scats in one day. So if she was getting food every one of those times, her, her drive would have gone down over the course of the day because she was getting more and more and her tummy was filling up. Um, and it also means that the, the handler had to carry lots and lots of food that they were getting rid of. So um, all that the handler has to carry is their toy, 
press when they're toy motivated like that. And then they 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 don't saturate. They want to keep going all day long. And I, I can tell you they don't get tired. That's what we look for. So they'll just keep going and going. Thank you. And I actually have one more question. Um, have you had any dogs that have just alerted you like when you're just like walking down the street or anything? Yeah, one of my favorite stories is Wicket, the snare dog. She worked until after her 13th birthday. And um, she lived to be over 15. And after her 15th birthday, she was old and senile and you know didn't really much know where she was. And she wasn't very good at walking. Um, but Amy Hurt, her handler, who lives here in Missoula, took her out and they were walking on a Forest Service road and they came on a big old pile of bear scat. And and you know, even even old senile wicked, she dropped and alerted to the bear scat. So it's always in, yeah, you don't turn it off, it's always there. Thank you. Hello there, my name is Dio. I'm from Gardner, and my question is for all three of you on, have you ever had a favorite rescue dog, or has there ever been a dog that, like, specially bonded with you and wouldn't work with anyone else? Oh, I mean, it's fun. <laughs> go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Well, I'll tell you, it's a, it's a, I, I, I'm, I'm normally the boss, right? So I sit in the office and I, I don't handle dogs. I don't go to the field. I have my own dogs um, that, um, that, that I just hunt birds with. And um, I think it's a special relationship that people have with a dog that works, that they work together. I only do that for part of the year, but our handlers who work with those dogs all year round, and they really depend on each other. It's like a, it's like a coworker. Um, and and they they almost always every one of our dogs when they retire and many of them work until after the 12th or 13th birthdays but when they retire they almost always retire with their primary handler because because they're so tight because they're so bonded um, so it's um, yeah it's, it's it's often people's first working dog that is the special one that they measure every other one against but they all get very close. And I don't have anything really to add. Same thing. I haven't had the opportunity to do that directly in the field, but I have my own dogs, and I've, had, I've never been in my life without a dog. So actually, if I could go off and do something else, this would actually fascinate me. <laughs> the, the connection of dogs. Thank you so much. Hi, um, I'm Lane. I'm from Hellgate, um, and I was just wondering what was the oldest dog that you've been able to successfully. Well, it's a big investment to take a dog and, and, and to train them. So we often, we look for one and two year olds to start with. We, we tend to avoid puppies because they're not really fully baked, you know, they, and you don't know what their personality is going to be and how hard they're going to work and all that stuff. So we try to wait until they're kind of an adult. Um, but it's a lot of investment. We invest about ten or $15,000 to get that dog trained to do the work. So we try to find them young so that, so that that investment pays for lots and lots of years. But we have had a few dogs, seven and eight years old, who are just amazing dogs who needed to be rehomed, and, and we worked with them. And like I said, we've had, I think 13 was the oldest working dog we have. And those dogs aren't going, you know, in big mountains to find Wolverine or Bear Scat those times. Often they're working, you know, for little stuff like snails or lizards or things like that um, on flat lands because their, their bodies are broken down. But those old dogs are really good at problem solving, so they're really valuable. Thank you. Hi, I'm Priscilla. I'm from Ryder. Um, and I was just wondering if you could tell us about how much some of the technology costs, especially some of the camera technology that you mentioned earlier developed by the rocket scientist. Um, well, I'll tell you about those cameras and then I can tell you about the really expensive stuff like the collars and all of that, which is amazing. And, and I want to be clear. You know, people say, well, you use dogs or you use collars. You use them both. They tell you different things. So, you know, often we were, we're, we were just on a sheep capture where they were capturing them to put collars on them, and the dogs were telling us whether individual sheep had a disease or not. So they kind of go together nicely. Those cameras are very interesting because um, a nonprofit organization took over. Steve works for a nonprofit organization called Resolve. So they make them, and they're not trying to make money on them. They're trying to save wildlife doing this. So they're very, very hard to get right now um, because they're manufactured in small quantities, but they only cost about $600 each. Yeah. And, and then, you know, with a nominal fee to the satellite company, that's a few dollars a month for them to run. So they're quite inexpensive. But that's just one of the things. 
Yeah, and just maybe adding on to that a little bit. Um, so now, just recently, we've started using cameras, and I've kind of alluded to this, but haven't really maybe fully explained it. But we're now using cameras to estimate abundance of all kinds, like all kinds of species. Um, or, and certainly uh, another thing we call occupancy, or just we're not trying to get that abundance, but we're just trying to get at where's that animal on the landscape. Um, but yeah, it's the same thing. So we're using the the higher end cameras are five to six hundred dollars a piece. Reconyx is like a major brand. You'll see brownies in the store. Sometimes we're using brownies, and you, and it depends on the project and what you need. But that'd be like two hundred fifty, three hundred dollars for a camera that we're using. Um, but but just to let you know that. So any of you that think about like math and stats, some of that. If if an animal does not have a unique marking, and so that camera's put up. This animal walks by and we see it. But we the challenge was how do we estimate population size from that? And actually, it was a, a grad student here that made a big revolution in that and, and just developed these mathematical statistical models that now she had to think about the problem differently. And so in doing that, we now are seeing even like I know fish and game now is transitioning from helicopter surveys to estimate DNL you know, populations to just camera surveys. Where we can now get it at actual abundance estimates of things like deer and elk, where you see a whole bunch of them. Um, in that, and then talk more about how that works. But it's like these innovations that happen, then um, it's kind of transforming now our ability to be like, oh my gosh, we put these cameras on now, we estimate abundance and distribution of all kinds of like uh, species biodiversity. One camera now can give you estimates of all kinds of species that are present. And how they're doing. Um, but the satellite collars <laughs> that we put on animals now, they can range anywhere from like 500 to 1500. They used to be thousands and they've come down some. But yeah, so if you're doing a study and you're, you're marking two, 300 animals um, with a satellite collar, you know, that's like a thousand feet, 400,000 right there, not even the cost of marking them. Thank you. Uh, I am Jack. I was wondering what you do with the invasive species. So uh, invasive species are getting to be a bigger and bigger deal. Um, it's really tricky though in how um, you approach that. So the one thing that um, like just we can pick like the feral hogs, so or feral pigs. So they have um, come into ecosystems throughout the southeastern United States in, in a particularly big way. But that's an example where we don't really have a whole grasp on that. They're really impacting the ecosystems, but it's hard once a species like that established, eliminated for a lot of reasons. Um, but now let's jump to um, uh, like Hebrew and Quagga mussels. How many of you have heard of those? I'm just curious. You know, it's a lot of hands. So let's get it's not like like if I had like there's a lot of news in that we want to keep those out, but all it takes is one establishment of those adult zebra clacking muscles in the body of water, and we can lose the whole system. Because once they're established, like aquatic systems are especially tough. There's no easy matter getting them out. So there, that's why all those boat checks happen, because we want zero to show up in the landscape. Um, so it, it our strategies to all that just depends on how established. But it's getting to be a bigger, bigger challenge for native species. Anything to add? Well, yeah, and we we prevention is always the best, right? To keep them from being introduced to those places. And so examples like that, we, we have dogs who sniff boats. So a visual inspector might take them an hour to do a large boat. It takes a dog about three minutes to do a large boat because they just sniff it, right? Um, and what's cool about that with the zebra and the quagga mussels. We can see the adult mussels that are stuck on there, but the dog can actually smell the villagers, they're called, the microscopic larvae that are that, that are how they reproduce and how they get to the ground. Well, Fenton and his, his buddies can smell six of those microscopic larvae in a 10-liter bucket of water. So they can help us prevent that from getting to Flathead Lake in the first place. But then the other thing we can use dogs for is mapping when there is an infestation, right? Um, so then we know where to do control. So the dogs can help us find invasive plants. For example, we do it in I Iowa with um, something called Lespedeza or Chinese bush clover. So the dogs tell us where it is, and then they can do the control. 
And we also use dogs for eradication. And one of the best examples of eradication is right there, Mount Sentinel. So there's a plant up there called Dyer's Lobe that came from, um, it came probably from Utah and there are whole hillsides of it covered it in Utah. And a few plants showed up here and the Missoula County weed folks got on it and they were having weed pull days and volunteers and everybody pulling out and they couldn't get them, couldn't get all of them. And they said, could you come in and use the dogs to help us see if we missed any plants? They, they've been doing this for five or six years. And they said, can, can you see if we're missing some plants? The dogs. So the first year that the dogs went here, on, right here on the mountain, after the humans went in and pulled every plant they could find, the dogs came and they found over 500 plants. <laughs> so now, that was, I think, 13 years ago. We have continued to work on Mount Sentinel every year since. And, um, and we find some years, two, three, four plants, some years, 10 or 12, depending on what year. And these are seeds that have been in the seed bank that whole time. But the best part about it, the reason the dogs are so good at it is because they're searching with their noses. They're finding the plants before they flower when they're about this big. And, but if I go out and look for them, I have to wait until I can see flowers. But it's very quick from once they have flowers to when they're dropping seeds. So you're almost too late. By the time we can do it, we're too late. So they can be useful at all the stages of, of, of those sorts of, of with invasive species. But obviously it's much better to prevent on the front end. Thank you. We're going to take two more questions. More questions, please. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm from Lockwood, and I was wondering, you said that the dog that was in Africa used to be Blackwood and the uh, Browning area. Can you tell us the backstory of how he was rescued? We don't know a lot about Ruger's early history. He was the only dog in his litter who survived, um, and we don't know why that was. He was a tough character, though. He um, uh, he bit me. I have a scar from Ruger. <laughs> He's no longer with us. But he um, um, he just ended up in the shelter there in Browning. And that was all we could find out was that the rest of the litter had been, um, you know, either put down or died. We didn't know if it was um, a disease or parvo or what, or um, but but he was he was a fabulous dog. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is James. Um, I'm from Helena. Uh, how much does it anger the both of you that people are poaching rhinos because of their horns made of the same material as our hair and our fingernails? Yeah, it makes me mad. It makes me mad, but I also have some understanding, particularly for the people on the ground. Because often what happens is, you know, the guy who gets sent in to, to try to kill a rhino, he's, he's often just trying to make a little money and feed his family. And it's almost always men who get, you know, and they, and they get sent in. Sometimes they'll give them a gun. Sometimes they'll go, but those guys, they might make 50 or $100. It's the, the really the nasty people are the middlemen and the, and the people sending them from farther away. And that's, it's another part, I didn't mention it, but it's another thing that the dogs can do is they'll find evidence, shell casings, even gum wrappers, things like that, that we can trace back and find out who sent, who aren't those guys, who sent them. And quite honestly, people on the ground are often not the, 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 the worst. They're trying to, they're just trying to get by. The, the folks who send them are the ones that we would really like, that, that quite honestly, they don't need the money. They probably understand the difference between, you know, that it's just a fingernail, but they're just trying to make a whole bunch of money. Those are the ones who make me mad. I just add in, and that's what makes it so complicated and hard to, um, but generally speaking, you know, just in this field, you, get angry a lot when you look at things like this that are causing such pains and you um but it's it's also why a lot of people would pursue sort of like a passion based career path for you like seeing what you can do to, to help them. Thank you. Thank you guys those were great questions. Thank you very much, Pete and Bree and Chad. That was outstanding. And Fenton, too. Amazing. That was a great session. Thank you so much.